Now we've got about 10 people, about 13 people, and just wait another minute and a half. All right, guys, what I'm gonna do right now is uh, I'm gonna mute everyone so that way I can talk. But remember, you have the chat next to it that you can write your questions on the chat and it appears here. So that way I can address the questions. And then during the conversation, I would also unmute you at times for you to talk. But in the beginning, I'd like you to listen, okay? And then if you have any questions, like I said, just write on the little chat area that you see on the bottom. And you can write your questions there at any time. And then as I will talk, if I find the time to be dealing with your questions, then I'll go ahead and answer, all right? So I'm going to make sure everybody's mute, all right? And we get started. All right. Good morning. You hope everybody's doing well. You know, yesterday we talked a lot about the driving and how important the driving game is now with the new rules. You know, more... Um, more of the rules create quality, more you're going to see driving increase, you know, because you want to create movement. You want to create situations, okay? So what we're going to do today is that we're going to actually, we're still working on the offense. Next week, we start working on defense. But on this week, we're still working on the offense. So we talked about the driving point of view. But now we're going to talk a little bit about the perimeter, or as we call vertical part of the game. The horizontal part of the game is driving. Vertical part of the game is any time you're in a position to shoot, okay? So that's what's called the vertical game, but a lot of people also call that the perimeter game, okay? So what, are you, what basically is the perimeter game? If we take our trusty board right here, what is the perimeter game? The perimeter game is this area right here that starts with a two-meter line, and it creates kind of a half moon or, a, let's say, you know, a half of a pizza, depending if you're hungry, Okay. So that, that is the perimeter game, okay? So the perimeter game is what you do in this area. I have a different way to look and to teach than most people. As <clears throat> we have in America, we have position one, position two, position three, position four, and position five. That's how we basically say in US, okay? As we know, Europe does in a different way, but we're Americans, so we're gonna do it our way. So that's one, two, three, four, five. I teach a little bit different, okay? What I do is that I don't teach one, two, three, four, five. What I teach is this, 12, 23, 34, and 45. Almost like a leap. Because the reason is you're not just a position four. It's not a place where, let's say, you have an X max on, a, on, on the floor. You know, it's not like you have an anchor that you can only be in that area. So if you are a 23 person, right, you here, you're 23, that means that all this area right here, you have to learn how to shoot from all this area. So that means you have to develop not just the spot itself of the shot, but you have to develop the, the, the movement laterally, backwards, forward, all that is part of your game. The next thing it does when I teach it this way is to create this you know, let's say this little diamond shape, all, you know, way in my head. So if I have this diamond shape, as we say here, I'm going to make a diamond shape right in front of my areas. 
because again, that's the area that I have to be active at. So this whole area here, if I'm a two, three, this whole area here is important for me to learn how to fake forward, fake to the right, fake to the left, fake diagonally here, fake diagonally here. And what happened is this is where the center basically work at. The center usually works on these little gaps that you see between these places. That's the perimeter game. So what we're going to work on today is how do we train to be a perimeter player, okay? Again, if you have any questions, if I'm moving too fast, you can go ahead and chat your question over there, put them in my Zoom chat, and then I would answer your questions. So remember, I look at it as you have four areas of shooting, okay? Contrary to what a lot of people say five, I say four. The four areas of shootings are these areas right here, one, two, three, four, that I call 12, 23, 34, and 45. So when I'm training a player, I'm not going to develop him to be a, a, you know, a two shooter. No, there's no such thing. I'm going to develop him to be a 12 shooter or a 23 shooter. Or in many cases, the great drivers, they're going to be able to do both. And that's what we're looking for. Okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you have any questions, just put, put it down in writing and then I can answer to you. Okay, so let's just start. So the first thing is that your ability to move is key, okay? Um, thank you, Jerry, that was perfect. I'll make sure I put it up higher. So let's just do it. Jerry just said maybe a couple of times, my board is a little bit low. So here's the board that we're talking about, okay? So again, look at the areas, right? Look at the areas that we're working on. So the area is basically somewhere between six and a half, seven meters, to so let's say about four meters or five meters. That's really the area that we're talking about, you know, a, a perimeter play. Once you get inside this little peak area right here, that's really no longer outside shooting. That's really more like inside. That's the two meter area. You want to try to stay away from the two meter area unless you are in transition for a drive or as we'll talk a little bit later today about the post up moves. But that's what we're looking for. So we're going to talk about these four specific areas here. Okay, all right. So what does it take? I mean, how, how do you create your ability to move? Because you don't swim. Remember, you have the ball in your hand or you're getting ready to receive the ball in your hand. So the idea is when you are a perimeter player and you are moving, <clears throat> you are moving from your shooting zones, your four shooting zones, you have to figure out a way to move unilaterally, right? Where your whole team can balance out with you Yet at the same time, you are in position to shoot the ball. That is a key. I see a lot of people out there, they're going from one shooting position to the other, and they have their head down. They're swimming, or they have their hands in the water. No, my hand has to be up at all times. This is the bread and butter. So no matter what I do, my hand has got to be free. So if I'm moving, I'm moving with my other hand going one way, or going forward, or going laterally. But this hand is ready to shoot. I have to have my hand ready. A lot of times people say, gee, why is it some of these great shooters like Pranovic or, or Tony was or Estiardi was or some of the great quick shooters that we see around the world? You know, we now with the men's team, we have a Johnny Hooper. You know, we have a Maggie Stephens with an Ash. How they can shoot the ball so quick? Because their hands are always ready to shoot the ball. Their posture is always ready to shoot the ball. Because it doesn't do any good for you to catch the ball and you don't have your posture ready. Your body is turned, you know, wrong way. Instead of leading with your, let's say if you're a right-hander, instead of your left leg being in front, where well, you can get ready to basically explode into a PQ power quickness shot, you basically are in the wrong position, so you have to, again, get in position. And we will talk also about the fake, because the fake is also a key. There's too many of you that use a fake as a habit. A fake is a weapon, not a habit. It is very natural that people catch the ball, the first thing they do, they go like this. Why? The moment that the ball is in your hand, it should be a weapon. That means the moment that the ball hits your hand, it should be in position to pass or shoot. So I don't understand, I will never teach somebody catching the ball and going like this, or catching the ball and going like this. I don't understand that. You catch the ball, you're ready to go. 
So if I catch the ball, I'm right here and I go, okay, I'm ready. I can look, I can move my head. I go, my, but my hand is in position to shoot or pass at any time. I see a mistake, the ball is gone. So this is posture. This is vision. This is understanding your position. And that's what I think has got to be the key in all of us is understand our position. So let's talk about the legs. Let's say I'm position 23 or 32 or 34 or 43. I'm somewhere in that top, okay? That's most of the time what you're going to find is you're going to be somewhere in this top over here, okay? These two guys right here, one and five, are usually pretty pressed. Most teams are going to press them pretty hard. <clears throat> and that's why later on I will tell you about the post up. But most of the time, the stuff is going to be happening up here. So what kind of legs would I use? Okay. Egg beater? No, absolutely not. All the egg beater does is a sustention leg. An egg beater is to keep you up. Okay. So egg beater is if somebody tries to push you down, egg beater keeps you up. If somebody tries to push you forward or backwards, it keeps you staying in the same place. So it's to sustain your body. That's what egg beater does. Movement is done with other leg work. So vertical breast, vertical scissor. What is the difference between vertical breast and vertical scissor? Vertical breast usually means up and down, right? So you take a breast stroke and you kick it and it goes straight up. That's what you use when you pass. That's what you use when you shoot. Right before you're shooting, you get into that posture position, you do a huge breaststroke kick up, and you shoot the ball. That is vertical breast. Okay? What is vertical scissor? Your body is in a sideway motion. So some people have their legs to the side. It can be to the right. It can be to the left. There's no right or wrong, guys. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay? So if you have the ball, let's say your legs to the right, you're going to basically do a scissor kick to either put yourself back straight or to maybe move yourself even more of the angle that you want to look at. So that is a vertical scissor. These leg works have to be done every day. <clears throat> That's why I do not like, sometimes people put these heavy balls and they sit over there with these two, three kilo balls and they're walking forward. To me, it's kind of a little bit, is it going to hurt you? Of course not. But is it going to really help you specifically? No. So what I want to do is that why don't you take, instead of putting the ball in your hand like this, because, you know, last time I checked, with except for the goalie, you're not allowed to have both hands out of the water. That's, you know, that can be a penalty shot even against you if you do it inside the five. So why instead not put the heavy ball, let's say, in your shoulder or maybe the other shoulder, right? And then as you're walking, you're doing vertical breast, vertical scissor, stepping forward, donkey kick, stepping forward, vertical breast, vertical scissor. Now you're training all the different stages of your leg. And that is really what spider legs are. Spider legs are a combination of all these legs put together. So my advice would be like this. Starting on the three or the four or the two, you start and you do your shooting. Again, you're not practice scoring, you're practice shooting. So what you want to do is you start at the three, you move. Scissor kick left, scissor kick left, shoot. Scissor kick right, scissor kick right, shoot. Vertical, vertical up, shoot. Vertical up, shoot. Vertical with a donkey kick back. What is a donkey kick? A donkey kick is if you take your body this way, if you go sideways, it goes this way. If you go the other way, it goes this way. If you do the step gather that when you step forward, but what do you do when you step back? I don't want to just egg beat her back because that means I am negative if I try to shoot the ball. What you do is you take, usually, if you're a right-handed uh, shooter, you take your right leg and throw it straight back, and then just pull yourself back slowly where you can still shoot during the motion of the donkey kick. So what you want to do is you always want to train shooting moving right, shooting moving left, shooting moving forward, shooting moving back, shoot moving up. So that's five shots from each one of these points. So again, you do it from here, and then you do it from here, and then you do it from here, and then back here, then back here, then back here, then back here. One, two, three, four, five spots. That's 25 shots. Just think about it, that's just one position. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm a, like I said, I'm a perimeter player and I have to learn how to more or less, except for, 
some very high levels, most players in high school, college, or even in the beginning level, they have to learn how to shoot the ball from all these areas. So try to spend one day when you're just working on a specific area. Remember, muscle memory is huge. If you try to do too much, you're not going to remember. Develop one shot before you move to the other. So let's say right now, you know what? I'm going to work on shooting from the two position. And you basically work the whole week on moving to the right, shooting, moving to the right, shooting, moving to the left, shooting. You know, if you're a left-hander, okay, is one of the questions that's been asked here. If I'm a left-hander, should I develop my shot at 12-2? Uh, no. If you're a left-hander, you want to basically stay, you know, if you're a lefty, what you want to do is you do have to develop three, by the way. A lot of left-handers now are playing on this position, particularly when they do what they call Croatian office because, you know, that person could be driving and this guy can move in this way. So the, if you're a left-hander, you are developing this area right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven areas. Okay, So you're developing those areas of shooting. If you're a right-hander, you might have to go all the way to here. You know, very few players are going to be able to play, let's say, the four or five side and the one two side at a really high level. Um, in some countries, even for example, like in Italy, uh, we call that position in here, for example, they call them centrovasca, all right? Because again, it's more specific to that position. Position one, two are the left handers, but they are also the players that are going to guard the best drivers of the other team. So traditionally, players that play on the side are some of the better defenders in the world. When you think of great defenders, guys like Trobojevic, you know, guys that are like amazing defenders, that's what they usually play, okay? Where these guys over on this side, the 45 guys, I mean, the 12 guys over here, they're usually your quick drivers, your power drivers, because they are the ones that basically have to create the offense. You know, most of the offenses are created here. Obviously, if you're a Hungarian or if you're a Serbian in the moment with guys like Filipovic, Mandic, you know, for years, Hungary had Madarash, Benedek, all these left handers here. And that's why these teams all won gold medals is because they had such balance. I mean, they could attack equally from both sides. But not everybody's blessed with three left handers at six foot seven that all can shoot ball like cannons. But we can work at it. And um, over the years, we've had some great shooters. They're right-handers that shoot from this side. Uh, particularly on the women's side, there are some amazing shooters that shoot from here. Um, so it's just a question of training. Because as a right-hander shooting from here, your legs will be placed differently. Instead of your legs being more to the side, they'll be a little more forward because you need to wrap around. Otherwise, all you have is a sidearm. And if you have a sidearm, the shot blocker is going to stay there. So if you take your left leg and throw it forward a little bit more, now you can come over and you not only have this delivery right here, but you also have this delivery right here. So again, these are all leg situations, all right? All right, let's move on. Um, what, what do I need to do to be, let's say, coach? I mean, every time I try to get the ball, the person is right on me, okay? Because that is a question that a lot of people ask. You know, they're great shooters, but they can never really get their shot off because somebody's right on them. Okay, that's that distancy that we're talking about that you can create with your donkey kick, also with your forward step. You know, you must look like you're going to drive. You're going you're to look like you're going to try to get inside water on that guy. You're going to try to drive. You're going to try to get him excluded. That quickness of being able to go from horizontal to vertical and from vertical to horizontal is huge. That's what you're going to see. The great shooters, I think guys like right now, like guys like Peroni or Granado from Spain. I mean, these guys, they're like this. All of a sudden, they're here in the back here. They're so quick. And that's something you can do it. You can do it on dry land because you can sit over there and you can lay on your stomach and you can do some quick ups, right? You can lay on your back and quick sit ups. You can do sit ups from one side to the other. You can pendulum. All these kind of exercises. And again, all these things are in the app. You know, you can go in the app and look at that being demonstrated by players at the high caliber level. You know, you don't want me demonstrating, man. I mean, I don't know. It's been a year, that I, it's been a year since I've been demonstrating stuff. But it's there, and these guys will demonstrate for you, okay? But, again, I have to be able to get that guy off me. Remember what I said about power and quickness? If I look like I'm going to be so quick, 
that guy has to step back. That girl has to step back. As she does, as he does, boom, I explode into the power shot. Not only that, but if I can come over my hips more, so it's not always doing this type of abdominal motion. Sometimes I got to go this way, this way. Again, I have to be able to make them bite on my drive and then explode to the other side by using a scissor, a vertical scissor, okay? So again, if you use your four legs, remember, step forward, donkey kick, vertical breast, vertical scissor, egg beater, most of you learn a very early age. And like I said, the egg beater is your, to be honest, like I joke with my guys when I say, okay, guys, let's rest. That means they know it's egg beater. That's how we rest. We rest by doing egg beater. Because if you're an athlete, if you're a water polo player, guess what? Our world is water. We have to learn to egg beater to rest. And the way to do that is open up your hips the more as you can. Make shoulders, make sure your, your knees are very far apart so they're smaller circles but in a further way so you got better base. As you do that, you can actually egg beater for hours and it's actually a rest mode. Okay? So make sure we do that when we work in our legs. All right. What are the techniques, for example, that we must use as you're going from horizontal to vertical to create a shot? I'm in a position two. That means I'm mostly a right-handed shooter. That means I'm going to be slightly turned to face the cage. So let's look at our trusty board over here, right? So if I'm in a position two, right? So I'm here, all right? So I'm going to be, you know, my, remember what I said about that, that area that we talked about, right? So my diamond is facing the cage, okay? It's facing the cage. So the, I basically radiate this kind of shooting motion, okay? So I'm radiating the area that I want to shoot from, okay? And that's what I want to do. So again, how do I become really good at this? I have to make sure that when I'm in my position here, not only am I looking to all the places where I can pass and shoot, but I have to be able to deliver from different points. Remember, that is why it's so important that I learn to be 23 or 12, because I, I have to be able to move to my right or move to my left or move backwards, yet still maintain the same angle of shooting. That means that goalie can't take his eyes off me. That means that defender cannot put his arm down. If the defender cannot put his arm down, he cannot help at two meters. So sometimes it's just but how you move into that light top of that triangle, that diamond that we talked about, just as I did this, is going to help my two-meter man be able to get a pass off. Or why it help my two-meter man to get the ball in? So it is important to understand which areas you're looking at. Understand the zone. What I try to explain to a lot of players as they get into the higher level, and you guys can do that too. Understand that when you are in a position, <clears throat> what is my job? What is my job? You know, so many people say, well, I, I, I got I to gotta shoot, coach. No. You have to shoot. You have to pass. You got to move to your right, left. You got to be able to recover back on defense. You got to be able to cover for a teammate. I mean, there are so many things you can do on offense that you have to understand your job. And once you have done that, you're going to be a great perimeter player. So trust me, perimeter players right now, um, with the changes of the rules, we're going to need more mobile perimeter players. You know, for many years, between 1994 to about 2004, we had all these really big, powerful outside shooters. You know, it seems like everybody was over six foot six, six foot seven. And because the zones were very much kind of like what the old, uh, not old because it's still used today, uh, seems like everybody was basically using those two, three, four zones. But everybody just came back and did this and they would attack according to who had the ball. Again, that was great. You know, the, the, you know, I can remember teaching and I can remember people being taught that all you do is go back and forth between the center and the shooter, the center and the shooter. And, the, and the, basically the perimeter player didn't move. He didn't drive, did nothing. He just sat there with the ball. And then when somebody didn't put the, the arm up, he would shoot the ball. That was a lot of how they attacked for about 10 years. With the transition of the rules, not just the ones that just happened last year, but the ones that even happened, you know, right after 2012, in the middle of 2014, there was also a couple other things that changed there. It created more movement. It created more movement, okay? 
and, and by creating more movement, um, allowed us to be more creative on your shooting. So now with the new rules, you don't see that anymore. Take a look at the videos. You can go on YouTube and you can take a look, look at all the videos from the world championship, the finals between Italy and Spain, or you can see the Croatia, you know, Spain game, or you can see the, the Italy Hungary game. I mean, these games, you can see it. It wasn't everybody just standing around. It was people moving all over the place. It was really people moving and they're, you know, they're, they're coming out, they're moving to the right, they're moving to the left. So you can see that the goal is itself and goal is out there. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of your goal is out there. That's the other thing you didn't, you, you got to understand. It's not like the ball is always coming at you. Now the ball is, the guy's moving right, shooting left. The guy's moving left, shooting right. You know, so, hey, uh, you know, the, there's, there's some things that, that it, it, they're changing, guys. They're changing, okay? Um, so that's something that's really think about it. So let's just talk. We've got a few minutes. Um, you know, about the post-up, and the post-up is a key. Now, first of all, um, he, here's what happens in the post-up, okay? You're now being pressed, okay? So you guy being, the guy's pressing you, right? You uh, cannot get free, okay? You cannot get free, but yet you have to create something. Your center is being in man or woman handle. They're not coming in, or they're really having a hard time. They have a great two-meter guard. Um, the, your offense is just really not in sync. So now you have to create post-ups. So what are post-ups? That's a word that we took from basketball, okay? But in water polo, is different. The post-up has a life of its own, all right? <laughs> I, I love the post-up situation because a lot of people think that, oh, well, oh, coach, our offense has a lot of post-up. Well, you don't want five people posting up. Because that means everybody's committed to the offense. That means you're going to give up a lot of counterattacks. And, man, in water polo, one of the two things you never give up. You never give up a counterattack. You never give up a goal from center. If you never give up a counterattack and you do not give up a goal from center, the chances are you're going to be in a game to win. But if you give these up, trust me, you're probably going to lose the game. Okay? So make that a rule. If you're a player, you tell yourself, if I'm guarding two meters, I can be excluded. I can even be called for a penalty shot, but this person will not score a goal. At the same time, if you're on offense, you say, no matter what I do, if I'm driving, if I'm shooting, if I'm passing, this guy that's guarding me, it is not going to get open on a counterattack. If you have a mentality as a team that you don't give up counters, you don't give up goals out of two meters, the chances of you winning 90% of your games are pretty darn good. Okay? So let's talk about the pull stop. Just as we spoke about our one, two, three, four, five, you have the different types of post up. Okay? What we call the wing post ups are the ones where either the five person or the one person comes into a post up move. So, how does that work? Again, you've got an offense like this. The center is kind of struggling. You know, the, the, the meter defender is really dominating the center. You know, everybody's kind of being pressed, you know. And then what we do is at that point, usually some kind of a, either vocal communication or a play call or even a situation on the clock. A lot of teams, what they'll do to say, hey, if the clock gets to 10 seconds and our center is not established, he will slide out and you'll call it either right. You can call it one or five. He will slide out this way. He doesn't get out, by the way, guys. He just slides out this way a little bit. And then this guy just comes in and establishes a post-up situation. So he does this. Okay? Everybody just kind of do a little bit of a lift shift. And this guy is now in position. If he drops, remember what we talked about, now he moves laterally and he has the cross-play shot. If he stays on a press, you put the ball into the post-up move. And as a rule, I'm not saying it's 100%, but as a rule, the referees have a tendency to pay off post-up fouls more than they do center and there's a very logical reason is not that the referees are not nice guys because they are they're just like any of us but is the difference is that obviously a center is a specialist in that position and a center defender is a specialist in that position when you take a post-up player that is pretty good and he takes in a defender that is not very good then obviously the way that that person fouls is not very good and that's what causes to be ejected Real quick, we've got about two minutes. 
So that's the post up from one and five. The other post up that's becoming very common, very, very common, is another one that let's just say they're running, you know, let's say a two, three zone, you know, so let's just say they're running, let's say a, um, a, th a three, four zone. So they're coming back like this, you know, and you have like this kind of zone, okay? So what's happening a lot of times now is that this guy maybe will drive across. So basically what he's trying to do is to kind of bring everybody to that side, okay? And then this center will move here. And then this guy will drive. If he can get inside water for the pass, he will do it. But if not, he drives, okay? And he gets some kind of a position. So it's a post up that can go. If he drives and get in this position, then the wing is going to pass him to a post up move. If the defender protects itself and it comes here and he's in here, then the pass comes in here and he's still in position to shoot the ball. So these are driving post ups, they're diagonal driving post ups. These kind of post ups are the most popular ones. The last one that is used, but we will talk about that one next week when we talk counterattack, are the ones, of course, that are coming off the counterattack. And when you come off the counterattack with a post up, you're not really trying to post up to score. You're not really trying to post up for, let's say, trying to be special. What you're trying to do is number one, stop the clock so you have more chance, more time on your offense. But number two, you also try to get an exclusion on a player that doesn't necessarily usually play on that position. All right. Okay. Now, I think I covered everything I wanted. Oh, let's talk about the fake real quick, real quick one. Guys, when you do a fake, please, 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 please. When you do a fake, your hand has to be facing the goal because this is how you shoot the ball. Look, this is how you shoot the ball, okay? So whatever fake you do, this is how your hand should be. What happens if you fake with a ball like this? Or some of you fake like this? Or some of you do this? The goalie knows you can't shoot this way. You can't shoot this way. So if you fake with, in this position at all times, where no matter what kind of fake, you move it, hey, I'm headed here. I can go up and down a fake. I can move sideways. I can bring it over my head. But look at my hand. My hand is always in position to shoot. Remember that. We're going to do a whole special on fakes with some demonstration of what the fake should be like. A fake is so important, but right now you don't fake. You just move the ball as a habit. You catch the ball and you go like this, or you do it kind of like what they call the Orange County spin. You're spinning the ball in your hand. Why? Be the ball like this. You go to make a mistake. Boom. Hey, there's a guy wide open. Pass. But again, if you're doing all the stuff, it's not going to happen. All right, guys. As always, a lot of fun. I will see you guys next week. And uh, remember, stay in shape and stay smart. All right? Have a good day, guys. I'm out. Thanks, Rico.